everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today, Grade 12s. We are looking at exam preparation and we're looking for at exam preparation for Paper 2. Now, you know that your Paper 2 is divided into different sections. You've got your Euclidean geometry, you've got trigonometry, analytical geometry and statistics. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at, look at the two sections that make up about 50% of your paper and that being analytical geometry and trigonometry. Obviously being at this time of the year where it's come to the end of term two, we're only looking at the work that you've done up to this point in the year which is by the end of term two, but remember your final exam will be made up 50% of all the trig you've ever learned and all the analytical geometry you've ever done. Everything will all get rolled into one to test your knowledge over the last four years of your maths career. All right, so something that you need to remember and hopefully you all do this is that you need to remember when you approach any maths question in an exam or test situation, read the maths problem thoroughly before starting on any calculations. If you just have a quick look at the problem, you may misunderstand what is really being asked and often you then misunderstand what needs to be done. So you sort of jump to a conclusion without really understanding what it is the question requires of you. So make sure it's so important to get that first step correct. Make sure you understand what the question is asking before you attempt doing it. All right. Okay, so let's have a look at our first question for today. I want to jump straight into it. In today's lesson, we're only looking at exam or test type questions. Really, we're starting now to prepare for prelims and end of the year exams. So these are the kind of questions you need to be exposed to. And remember, by the time you're writing your prelims and by the time you're writing your final exams, you need to be going over lots and lots of past papers, as many as you can get your hands on, that are relevant to the CAP syllabus, of course. All right. So we're going to start today's lesson with a bit of analytical geometry. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the question just yet. I'd like you to have a look at it. And I want you to mark down, you might not have a chance to do the entire question. It's only three minutes I'm going to give you. But mark down as much information as you can from the given information and then attempt to answer at least the first question. All right. So guys, three minutes starts now.
Okay, guys, this is quite a nice question. I hope you thought so too. Here you're looking at using the properties that you understand so far about analytical geometry and about circles that are not centered at the origin. We're using those properties to work out the equations of the circles. Okay, let's go through the questions together and mark down the given information. All right, and let's also notice some important things that they tell us. So they say, in the diagram, we've got two concentric circles. What does that mean? It means that they share the same center. So these circles have the same center. So the coordinates of the center point are exactly the same. They tell you that the center, which is the point A, is on the y-axis. So that's really nice because half the work to finding the center, the coordinates of the center is done because I know that if it's a point on the y-axis, what is your x value? The x coordinate must be zero. Okay, so it's going to be zero and some y value. The smaller circle cuts the y-axis at the origin and the point B. Okay, so as you can see in your diagram, it's cutting at naught and then it's cutting at point B. The line through B has equation y is equal to 3 over 2x plus 6. So straight away from that, I can already start thinking, well, how, what can I mark down on this diagram? I know that B must be the point because it's the y-intercept of the straight line. B must have coordinates 0 and 6. Okay, so my y-intercept is 6, so therefore I straight away know what the coordinates at point B is. I can also then work out what the y-intercept at point R is. Given that I've got the equation of the straight line, I can work out that the x-intercept, if we say let y equal to 0, I can work out that x is going to be, it's going to be minus 6 divided by 3 over 2, so that I can solve for x. Remember when you divide by a fraction you invert and multiply. Alright and what does that give me? It's going to be minus 12 over 3 which is minus 4. So I can already work out and this is important information you want to fill in before you even really look at what the question requires. I know that point r is minus 4 and 0 so I've already got so much of information. Okay. When they ask you to work out the equation of the circles, you remember that the formula you use is this. x minus a squared plus y minus b squared is equal to r squared, where a and b are the coordinates of the center. Now, what are the coordinates of the center of these circles. So, so far if you look at your diagram you already know that the x coordinates at point A is 0. What is the corresponding y value at that center point? And guys, if you look at your diagram it should be apparent to you. you sh it should just leap out at you because if you look at the line OB it is the diameter of the smaller circle, O, all right? So therefore, all right, we can see that if my y-intercept is 6, which of course it is, that tells me that the length OB must be 6 units. Okay, but we know that A is the center of the circle, so therefore it's midway between point B and point O. So therefore A must have the coordinates 0 and 3. How did I get that? Well, we can use the midpoint, right? We can use the formula for midpoint. We know that B is the point 0, 6 or 0, 6 and the point O at your origin is 0, 0. So using your midpoint formula, you could get to the value of uh, the coordinates of A, which is X is 0 and Y is 3. So you can use the midpoint there, or just by logical deduction, just by looking at your diagram, you could work out that A is the point 0, 3. So now let's work out the two equations. Okay, so I know so far, and this is now for the circle... What are we calling that circle? We're going to call that circle O, and we'll call the other one R. 
All right. Okay, well, let's call the first one A and the other one B. I know that the center, so in x minus a squared, I know that the x coordinate at the center is 0 plus y minus b squared. The value of b was positive 3, so it's y minus 3 squared is equal to the radius squared. Now, there's another interesting thing. Can we work out the radius? We're dealing with the smaller circle. Can we work out the radius? Yes, we can. We know that the diameter is 6 units. We've just seen that the distance from O to A is 3 units. So therefore, my radius has a value of 3. So therefore, your radius squared is going to be 3 squared. So your, your equation becomes x squared plus y minus 3 squared. You can multiply that out. They didn't ask for this in any specific format, but we can multiply that out. And we'll get that x squared plus y squared minus 6y is equal to naught. How did I get naught? Well, I took the 9 over to the right-hand side, and 9 minus 9 gave me naught. Okay, and then for the larger circle, we know that the center coordinates are still the same, so it's still going to be x minus 0 squared plus y minus 3 squared is equal to the radius squared. Now let's have a look at that radius. What would that be? Okay, so you know that your radius is going to extend from point A, now this is for your bigger circle, to point R. Okay, so that's your radius there, from point A to point R. And that will be the radius of your bigger circle. Do we have enough information to work out the length? Of course we do. We know that from O to A is 3 units. We know that from R to O is 4 units because using our x-intercept of the straight line, y is equal to 3 over 2x plus 6, I can work out that R is 4. And I know that obviously your axes are perpendicular to each other, right? You learned that when you learned about the Cartesian plane. So therefore, you can work out using Pythagoras. You've got a 3, 4, and the missing one would be 5, a 3, 4, 5 triangle. So using Pythagoras, you could work out what AR is. So I'm just going to write it down for formality, but you should, I think, all know by now how to work out Pythagoras. So it's going to be the square root of 4 squared plus 3 squared, which is going to give you an answer of 5. Okay, so therefore I can say that the bigger circle is going to have x squared plus y squared minus 6y plus 9 is equal to 25. So therefore you get x squared plus y squared minus 6y is equal to 16 if I take the 9 over to the right hand side. Alright, so that's the starting point in this one is just working out the equations of these circles. Now the next question then asks you to find, determine the coordinates of the point P. Now if you look at the diagram you can see that P all right, so we're just going to erase some of the stuff we had there. You can see that P is the point that is closest to point A. Obviously, it's a perpendicular distance. And uh, we also see that it's a point that lies on line R. Okay, the line passing through RB. Okay, so there are different ways to do it. The easiest one that I can see is that the point P is the point of intersection of line AP and line BR. So what I need to do is I need to find the equation of AP and solve simultaneously with the equation of BR, and that will give me the uh, point P. Okay, guys, so I think because it's going to be quite a lot of working and a lot of algebra that goes into this, I think let's think about this a little bit during a quick break, and then we'll come back and do this together. But now you've got more than enough information to attempt this for yourself. See you after this. 
Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, by now, you've all worked out the value of the coordinates at, uh, at point P. All right, you've got the X and the Y values. Let's go through it together and see if, if I've got the same answer that you've got or if you've got the same answer that I get. We've discovered that the point P is the point of intersection between lines BR and AP. So therefore, I need to solve simultaneously because I know to find any point of intersection, I always solve simultaneously. Right, so this is part two. Now, the equation of BR was given to you. So we know that the equation of BR, we've got y is equal to 3 over 2x plus 6. Now for the equation of AP, firstly you guys can see that AP is perpendicular to the line BR. So therefore, I now start thinking about the properties of the gradients of perpendicular lines. And I know that the product of the gradient of line AP and line BR is going to be equal to minus 1. Because we know that from perpendicular lines, we understand this already. Okay. Therefore, since... The gradient of BR is 3 over 2. The gradient of AP must be the inverse of that with the opposite sign. Okay, by now this should make sense to you guys because if you times the inverse of 3 over 2, the negative inverse, what happens, or the negative reciprocal, what happens? You're going to get an answer of minus 1. Okay, so minus 2 over 3 times 3 over 2 gives me minus 1. So I've got already that the gradient of line AP is minus 2 over 3. And then we times that by x plus the y-intercept. Now the y-intercept is where your line AP cuts the y-axis. And we see that that happens at point A, which we know has coordinates 0, 3. So therefore my y-intercept of line AP is 3. And now we solve simultaneously to find the coordinates of point P. Okay, so to solve we're going to say if we call this equation 1 and call the other one equation 2, we're going to say equation 1 equals equation 2 and this is obviously to find the coordinates of point P. Alright, so I'm going to say 3 over 2x plus 6 is equal to minus 2 over 3x plus 3. This is a straightforward linear equation, so we take our x's over to the one side. We get 3 over 2x plus 2 over 3x is equal to, take your constants to one side, so I subtract 6 from both sides, I get 3 minus 6 which is equal to minus 3. 3 over 2 plus 2 over 3, you can find an LCD there of 6. All right, and we multiply 3 by 3, so we get 9x. 2 by 2 gives me 4. So 9 plus 4 will give me 13x over 6 is equal to minus 3. So therefore, x is equal to you divide both sides by 13 over 6. And remember, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So we times by 6 over 13. And we see that x is going to give us minus 18 over 13. All right, now so far it seems like a lot of work and many of you will stop here. But if you stop here, you're going to lose a mark because... This is not a coordinate. This is just an x value. We need the y value. So we now need to take this x value and substitute it into either equation 1 or 2 to find the corresponding y value. Okay, so I'm going to put it into the equation for AP. But if you do the other one, BR, you'll get the same answer. So we know y is equal to minus 2 over 3 times x, which is minus 18 over 13 plus 3. All right, so here we're going to get minus times a minus is a plus, 2 times 18 is 36, 
And I think that's 3 times 13 is 39, or even better, what you could do, you could say 3 goes into itself once, 3 goes into 18, how many times? 6 times. So minus 2 times minus 6 is going to give me positive 12 over 13 plus 3. And in fact, guys, you can just save yourself a lot of time and do all of these fractions on your calculator, please. Um, it will save you a lot of time. So it's 12 over 13 plus 3. And that's going to give me 51 over 13. So therefore, P has coordinates minus 18 over 13 and 51 over 13. You can write this in decimal form if you like, but they haven't stated, so you can leave it in that form. And we just have a look at where P is to make sure that it makes sense for X to be negative and Y to be positive. Yes, it's in the second quadrant. That is a possible answer. Okay, and it is indeed, in fact, the correct answer. All right. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Just a word of, uh, or a reminder really from this question, even though you got those fractional values for X, a lot of you start thinking that because you get these fractions that don't look nice and neat, they're not whole numbers, you start thinking that you're wrong. But you can see that it is possible to get these mixed fractions to get improper fractions and all sorts of things as your answers. It doesn't necessarily mean that all your answers have to work out to perfect whole numbers for them to be correct. All right, so don't second guess yourself when you get fractional answers. But obviously, it's always a good idea to just go back and check, just in case you're wondering. All right, so we're going to move on to the next part. Remember, we're doing in today's lesson analytical geometry, and we're looking at trig as well. And we said together this makes up about 50% of your final mark. All right, so I'm going to give you guys now three minutes to have a look at this trig question.
Right, guys, so the thing I like about all the questions that we're looking at in today's lesson is it's already preparing us for tests and exam situations. And remember, when it comes to final exams, your exam for grade 12 is going to be based on all the work you've done in grade 11 and grade 12. So this question two is based on trig reduction, which you learned all the way back in grade 11. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves. So for part 2.1, we needed to simplify the trig uh, fraction, and then we're going to determine values of theta for two marks. So let's do the first part. For this reduction, we need to just remind ourselves about our quadrants and where our angles will be positive and where they will be negative. So remember your cast diagram, you have all ratios positive in the first quadrant, sine positive in the second, tan positive in the third, and cos positive in the fourth quadrant. Remember, all your angles in the first quadrant are less than 90 degrees, and then your angles in the second quadrant are between 90 and 180 degrees. Your angles in the third quadrant are between 180 degrees and 270 degrees, and then your angles in the fourth quadrant are between 270 degrees and 360 degrees. Okay, all right, so most of you hopefully remember this diagram and you remember how to apply it. You've done quite a lot of application by this point. So let's look at reducing our first expression, sine of 180 minus theta. So we see that that's going to land us. We first look at the angle and we see that that takes us to the second quadrant. We also note that sine is positive in that quadrant. So therefore sine of 180 minus theta will just be sine theta times cos of 90 minus theta. So we look at the angle. We know that it's in the first quadrant, but because it's 90 minus, we've got to be careful. We've got to start thinking about co-ratios, right? So cos of 90 minus theta, if you block out the CO, what are you left with? An S, and the S stands for sine. So cos of 90 minus theta will be sine of theta. So it's going to be times sine theta in the numerator minus 1. And that's all over cos of negative theta. Now remember your negative angles, your negative acute angles will end up in the fourth quadrant because you start going around in the opposite direction. So therefore cos of negative theta ends up in the fourth quadrant where cos is positive. So therefore cos of negative theta will be cos theta. So I end up with sine squared theta minus 1 in the numerator divided by cos of theta. Now there's certain identities that I advise all learners to just know in their head. Obviously it might be given to you on a formula sheet, but it's good to know certain identities in your head. And one of the famous ones obviously is cos squared plus sine squared of an angle is equal to 1. Now what do you have? You've got sine squared minus 1, so therefore if I rewrite that sine squared theta minus 1, that means I'm taking the cos squared over to the right hand side. So therefore the numerator I can rewrite as negative cos squared theta, and obviously your denominator will stay the same. And when you divide negative cos squared theta by cos theta, you will just get negative cos theta. Okay, all right, now for part two, they say hence. Now remember hence means use from what you've just proved, use from above what you've just proved to help you out. Hence determined for which values of theta the square root of 2.1 is going to be real when theta is an element from 0 degrees to 360 degrees. So they've given you a domain to work with and you need to see when is this expression going to be real. Now think about it. You know that the square root of a number, any number, will only exist if, so this is real, if and only if, x is positive. So whatever number is in here has to be positive. You know this already. You can only take the square root of positive numbers. So what are they asking you? 
you've got that entire expression from 2.1, remember, simplified to negative cos theta. You're now taking the square root of negative cos theta. So already you're thinking, well, negative cos theta, what's happening there? I'm thinking about my cos graph. So I really want to find out when cos of theta is negative, because then if I multiply it by negative, inside my square root is going to be positive. So this is what I'm saying. So we look at the square root of negative cos theta. Obviously, we can replace that inside expression with a negative cos theta, because we prove that, that that's what it's equal to. This is only going to be a real number when this negative cos theta is positive. We're thinking about our graphs here, right? So dividing both sides by a negative 1, it's the same as saying we're looking for when the positive cos graph is, when you divide by your inequality by a negative, remember your sign turns around, so it's, we're looking for where cos of theta is negative. Okay, because remember, if you think about putting it in brackets here, when this graph is negative, a negative times a negative gives me a positive, so I'm taking the square root of a positive number. So now go back to your graphs. Okay, this is defined between 0 and 360. That was the domain that you were given. And I draw a quick rough sketch of my cos graph, and I know that cos is negative when it lies below the x-axis, so it's in that portion there. We also know that these x-intercepts for my cos graph are at the point 90 and 270 degrees, so your cos graph is negative between 90 and 270 degrees, so therefore this expression will be real when theta, when theta is an element from 90 degrees to 270 degrees. All right. Okay, guys, I hope that you all understand that now and you see how when they say hands, you're going to make your life easier by using what you've just proved to help you out in the next part of the question. Okay, that's important. Always when they say hands, use what you've just proved. It will make your question much shorter. Okay, we're going to take a quick break now so you can think about all of everything we've discussed so far. When we come back, we're going to look at more trig. Welcome back from that quick break and in today's lesson remember we are revising analytical geometry and trigonometry. Before the break we looked at trigonometric reduction formulae and we're going to continue now with reduction but using actual values for our angles. So, so far we've just been looking at using theta and now we're going to use values for our angles and that's what we're going to reduce. All right, so we're going to have a look at question three. You can see that it's for eight marks. I'm going to give you three minutes to take this question down and see how far you can get.
Right, everyone. So this one is for quite a few marks. However, the concept here is something that you've been implying now since grade 11. So it's probably something that you are very, very familiar with. However, it's a question that often when learners are going through past papers, it's this type of question that they will have questions on. Okay, and it's one that you can get all the marks in. So it's a good one to understand really, really well. Okay, it is possible to get full marks for this type of question. So let's see how we get those full marks. All right, so in the first part of your uh, fraction here, you've got tan of 156 degrees times cos 114 over cos 744. And then we've got minus 1 over sine squared negative 66. It's always a good idea just to draw up a little cos diagram for yourselves, just to remind yourselves of where your angles are positive and where each of them sit. Where, well, where each of your angles sit on your quadrants, first, second, third, or fourth, okay? So when you reduce them, where do they sit? So a reminder that in your first quadrant, we're looking at angles that are 90 minus. In the second quadrant, it's 180 minus theta, and obviously your theta is an acute angle. And in the fourth, 360 minus. Okay, you should be very familiar with this cast diagram. All right. So for the first one, tan of 156 degrees. Remember what you're trying to do when you reduce an angle, when you've been given a value of an angle, is you're trying to rewrite 156 degrees in terms of these reduction notations that you are familiar with. So how can you rewrite tan of 156 either using 90 minus, 180 minus, 180 plus, or 360 minus? And you will see that 156 is the same as 180 minus 24 degrees. So what have I done? I've taken 156 and I've rewritten it. Okay, how do I know it's 24 degrees? Well, if you say 180 minus 156, what do you get? You get 24 degrees. So that's how you know what it is you're supposed to subtract from 180 degrees. And then we say times... Cos of 114, you will do the same thing. 180, it's closest to 180 minus, so 180 minus what gives me 114? So if we say 180 minus 114, I get 66. So I rewrite 114 as 180 minus 66. And I'm going through this in more detail than perhaps necessary just to show you and make sure that you get this question right in your exams. All right, that's all over. And as you can see, I'm going to run out of space here for the second part, but I'll put it in just now. That's all over cos of 744. Now, obviously here we've got an angle that's greater than 360, so we've got to add to 360 to get 744. So I'm going to do this on the side. So it's going to be cos 744 minus 360 gives you 384. So firstly, you can write 744 as 360 degrees plus 384. Remember when you're going 360 plus, it's a revolution. So you're starting in the first quadrant, going all the way around, and you're ending up in the same place, okay? So therefore, cos of 360 plus 384 is not going to change the sign or the value in any way. This will be the same as cos 384 degrees, okay? So 360 plus 384 is going to just be the same as cos 384. And the reason I want to reduce that to 384 is because it now becomes a simpler angle to get to from 360. So I say to myself, well, 360 plus what gives me 384? And it's obviously 360 plus 24 degrees. All right. So how would you check that for yourself? You'll go, well, 384 minus 360 is 24. So you know what you need to add to 360 to get 384. All right, guys, I'm going to remove this little diagram here on the edge so that we can fit in our remainder of this uh, sum. Or... There we go. All right, so now we've got minus 
1 over sine squared negative 66. Now let's talk about the sine squared for a little bit. Sine squared of negative 66. That is basically saying to you, this is equivalent to negative sine 66 squared. That's what that means. Okay? Now you will agree that when you square something, the answer is always going to turn out positive, right? So sine squared of negative 66 is equivalent to positive sine squared 66 as well. Because when you're squaring these two out, even though the beginning one was negative, when I square it out, I'm going to end up with the same answer. So yes, if you want to, you can change this negative 66 to a positive angle and then reduce it further. Sure, go ahead, do that if you like. But just from reasoning and from logic, we can see that sine squared of negative 66 is the same as sine squared of positive 66. All right, so therefore, my denominator here is just going to be sine squared 66. Okay, now let's do a bit of reduction here. Tan of 180 minus 24, well, that's in the second quadrant, so I'll get negative tan 24 times cos of 180 minus 66, that's also in the second quadrant, so we get negative cos 66, and that's over. Cos of 360 plus 24, that takes me into the first quadrant, and cos is positive there, so this will just be cos 24. And then we've got minus 1 over sine squared 66. Now, when I look at these angles, I start seeing that there's a relationship. I've got 24 degrees and 66, and I already start thinking, well, in the back of my head, 24 plus 66 is a special value. It's 90 degrees. Okay, so I already start thinking about co-ratios. Okay, so I start thinking about that. Now, minus times a minus in the top is a positive in my numerator. Okay. So that's uh, overall is just going to give me a positive sign. Tan of 24, remember you can rewrite tan from identities as sine 24 over cos 24. And then we've got times by cos 66. And then remember this was all over cos 24. So it's basically like saying times 1 over cos 24. But there's already a cos 24 here in, if I rewrite tan 24 as sine 24 over cos 24. So this is going to become cos squared 24 in your denominator. Okay, minus 1 over sine squared 66. All right, so I see now two angles have 66 and two angles have 24. So it's really a choice because we know that they add up to 90 degrees. It's really a choice for you to decide, well, do I work with 66? Do I work with 24? I'm going to choose to work with 66, but really you can choose to work with 24 uh, as well. So what I'm saying here is we can rewrite sine 24 as sine of 90 minus 66. So 24 is 90 minus 66. And we know that sine of 90 minus 66 will become cos of 66. Okay, and we know that from our co-ratios. And this is over in a similar way. Cos squared 24, we can rewrite 24 as 90 minus 66, and we know that cos of 90 minus 66 will become sine squared 66. Okay, now do you see we have the same angle, so it's easier to simplify this further. In my numerator, on the first uh, term, I've got cos 66 times cos 66, which is cos squared 66, all over sine squared 66. And because my denominators are the same, obviously I can add my numerators, so I get cos squared 66 minus 1 all over sine squared 66. Remember your identity, sine squared theta plus 
plus cos squared theta is equal to 1. So cos squared 66 minus 1 is going to be negative sine squared. How do I get that? Well, I'm going to take the 1 over to the right, to the left hand side, and take the sine squared over to the left, to the right hand side. And we end up with cos squared minus an angle will give you sine squared off that angle, negative sine squared. So therefore, the numerator here will be negative sine squared 66 all over sine squared 66. And when you divide that, you're going to end up with negative 1. All right, and this is why this question was worth eight marks. As you can see, there was quite a lot of effort and quite a lot of work we had to put into that reduction. And it was so easy to make a mistake anywhere along those steps. So therefore, it's important that you break up your angles using your reduction formula correctly. Okay, so just a reminder, guys, if you're using your calculator in trig for any section in trig, a reminder, have a look at this. You need to know how to use your calculator. If you decide, well, okay, my batteries are out and I need to borrow a calculator from a teacher or friend, make sure that they use the same brand of calculator that you use. This is so important because if you are not familiar with how a specific calculator works, you are very, very likely to get your calculations incorrect. So make sure, especially when we're talking about a trig, trig uh, question, trigonometry, make sure that you know how to use whatever calculator you're going to be using in your exam. And obviously you want to prepare for the, the case where your battery dies, so maybe just check your batteries beforehand. But if you have to borrow a calculator from your teacher in an exam situation, make sure it's the same one that you know how to use. Okay, so that's just a word of advice and a study tip for you as you prepare for your exams. Until next time, I'm Natasha. Cheers.